Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about how to become an OBGYN and this will also apply a little bit of how to apply to other specialties like internal medicine, emergency medicine, general surgery, psychiatry, and family medicine. If you are new, welcome. My name is Jani and I am an OBGYN intern. And if you have seen my previous videos, welcome back. I hope you have enjoyed them so far. This is just the beginning of my channel and of many, many ideas that I already have. If you are new and want to consider subscribing, um, I will leave a little link in one of these corners. And you can also follow me along on social media. I'm very active on Instagram mainly and Twitter as well. The links will be right here. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So one of the things that I get asked a lot is how do you become an OBGYN or how do you become a doctor or how the whole process goes. And in truth, it takes a really long time. Um, initially, there are several ways you can do this. There's two main roads that you can take. This will all start when you are in high school and you are applying to college. So you need to go to college in order to be able to become a doctor at least in the United States. Within college, there are two paths that you can take. Um, you can take a bachelor degree program and you can do a four-year program, or you can find some, of, some specialty programs that work in conjunction with a medical school, and those are called fast-track programs or um, dual degree programs where you get you do like two three years of a bachelor's degree you take specific courses and exams and then you are automatically put into a medical school that's affiliated with that college I did not do this I went through a four-year college I did a, a bachelor's degree in um, cellular molecular biology um, you can also do an integral biology um, or any kind of science major. This doesn't mean that if you do like a business uh, major or a social sciences major that you can't get into medical school. This just means that most people do have a science degree because it gives you the same all the courses that you need to apply to medical school within your bachelor program and that means you have you can do it quicker and you can also um, take less extra courses in addition to your required courses this is te technically going to depend on what you want to do and what the best road is going to be for you um, usually around your third year of college you will start preparing for the MCAT the MCAT is the Medical College Admission Test, and this is a really just a horrible exam, especially for people like me who are really bad standardized test takers. And the reason is because it has three main areas. One is um, a science, one is a verbal, and the other one is like social, social sciences or like math and physics. So it has three main areas and it has a couple of additional areas that have been added. The exam has changed a lot since I took it uh, about five year, five to six years ago now. Before um, when I took it, before I took it, it used to be uh, like a math and physics, chemistry and biology, verbal and a written part. When I took the exam, the written part was taken off and then you had the three main sections that had been made harder. And then in addition to that, we had a supplemental test section that was the beta testing for the new, pro the new MCAT. And it consisted of like sociology, psychology, anthropology, and um, those kind of topics and some statistics pulled into all of this. So the theory is that this test is designed to evaluate how successful you could be in medical school. Many studies have been done and to try and correlate if your success in the MCAT correlates to your success on step one and there is a lot of controversial data on this um, but you do need to do well on your MCAT if you want to have a good chance of entering at a US allopathic or a osteopathic school really not familiar with the new um, scores for the MCAT 
but you have to do well. Usually for allopathic schools, the scores tend to be higher and more strict. And then for DO schools, you can get a little bit of lower scores, but they also have some other um, evaluation criteria. I went to medical school in Puerto Rico. Um, we are allopathic US schools. Uh, even though a lot of people think we are Caribbean schools, we are not. Um, we are all MDs. Um, <clears throat> and three of the medical schools in Puerto Rico do accept students from the mainland and from other places to be students there. So if you're a student and you are looking for opportunities, you can always look to Puerto Rico as an alternative. If you're a U.S. citizen, it will be super easy for you um, to move to the island and get used to how things work. You will still be prepared enough to take the, M the step one, and we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, that is the main initial part of um, preparing to become a doctor. Once you have your MCAT, then in your fourth year of medical school, you will start your application process. And I don't remember how, I think it's similar to, oh, AMCAS, AMCAS, that's what it's called. American Medical College Admission Software, I think it stands for. And uh, AMCAS is basically like the common app for college but for medical school. It has the same kind of system. You input all of your things in one section and then you can choose all the programs and you make your payment and then it goes out to all the programs or, or, or all the medical schools. Um, then you get your interviews, you go on your interviews and then you get your acceptance. Most medical schools, to my understanding, have rolling admissions. That means that they select a group of people, invite them for an interview, and then so admit some people from that interview cycle, and then they get a, an acceptance letter. And you have a certain period of time between when you get your acceptance letter and you can reply. Because a lot of people are applying and there's not enough room for everybody, so as soon as you get your your acceptance letter, you have to start making considerations on what you want to do. So you went to college, you took your MCAT, you applied to medical school, and you got accepted. Now what? Well, medical school consists of four years in most places. Um, it's four years. The first two years are divided in into um, more classroom and more clinical scenarios. The first two years you learn all of the basic knowledge. You learn your biochemistry, your physiology, anatomy, um, genetics, and your systems based. In addition to that you also do the pharmacology, pathophysiology, physiology, and all those other um, classes. In my medical school we also did some psychiatry classes as second years and then you have your additional learning experiences. You have your shadowings, you have your PBLs which is problem-based learning and then you have your standardized patients. All of these components are there to help prepare you to, for the real world of medicine and it's a really frustrating time sometimes because there is a lot of material that you have to study and learn and um, you know master in a very short period of time and you kind of have to figure out your study method what works for you and what doesn't in a specific time frame. Problem-based learning is basically um, group sessions where they give you a problem and or a case or a scenario and you have to work as a team to try and figure it out to make a diagnosis to make a finding just to come to a conclusion on this specific scenario and what this does is it teaches you how to strategize or how to organize your thoughts when you're presented with a situation so that you can start developing your differential diagnoses and all of these other components of the critical thinking aspect of being a doctor and of the practice of medicine. After your first two years, then comes the big bomb. Step one. Step one or the cookie monster, the chupacabra, whatever you want to call it. Step one is horrible. Uh, 
Step one is a very tedious exam. It is very important for whatever path you choose to follow. And it's an incredibly stressful time. Um, a lot of people who have like huge breakdowns during medical school actually have their breakdowns during step prep time. And the reason is because you're basically taking two years worth of classes and knowledge and readings and all these things and piling them up into a test that is designed to make you question everything that you know. And if you don't have a good base, you're going to have to relearn everything in a short period of time. Most places you get like maybe six to eight weeks to prepare for the exam. Imagine taking two years worth of knowledge and having to pile it into eight weeks. It's horrible. Um, I did it, I studied for step in nine weeks and it was really hard. <laughs> Um, I used to wake up at around 6, 6.30 a.m. I would eat breakfast, get all my things ready, and then I would be studying by 7.30 to 8. No later than that, I was ready to begin my studying. Um, I did a very rigorous, rigorous, I did a very rigorous study schedule. Um, in which I had my lunch breaks, I had a break in the afternoon for like a snack and to like say hello to my husband and spend some little couple minutes of him, with him every day and then I would go right back to studying up until like 10, 10.30 p.m. when I finished all of my readings and all of my questions for the day. Um, step is, step one is a, I think it's a seven hour exam. So you are in a testing center for seven hours answering a bunch of multi multiple choice questions. And really, I didn't learn this until I took step two. I didn't do as well as I expected to do, but I did well enough that I was comfortable when I was applying. Um, but what my lesson was, which is why I got into this whole mess in the first place, was that I didn't do enough questions. I wanted to read all of the material and try to refresh all of my knowledge when really I should have focused a little bit more attention to doing questions and learning to answer the questions because you have the knowledge, you've been studying for two years, you, you have got this, but the questions are designed to trick you. The questions are designed to give you two possible answers and then one of those is better than the other because of some weird wording issue and that's where it tricks you that is the part of step that makes it super incredibly annoying to prepare for and take the exam so after you take step one usually you start your clinical rotations some programs are a little bit different but i'm talking about my own personal experience and the majority of the experiences of people. So you take step one and then you start your clinicals. Clinical rotations are the best part of medical school. They are incredibly exhausting, especially because you're probably very out of shape by this time. Um, you've been studying indoors for two years now. Um, you just took a super horrible morale debating test that quote unquote is going to define your future and <clears throat> you are working long hours, you're on your feet all day, every day, from 5 in the morning to let's say 6 p.m. and then you go home and you study because your clinical rotations, they can have um, ac ac academic activities, they can have cases that you have to read through and solve, they can have quizzes, and then you have the shelf. The shelf is basically a nice test for each specialty that you rotate through and it's basically meant to test your knowledge on that specialty. I actually really enjoyed taking the shelves because I felt like it was very easy to just answer question, answer question, answer question and just like be done. And for the most part, I feel like I did very well. Now going back a little bit to what I just said about step being quote unquote um, the definer of your future. The reason is because when you are applying to residency, which we will get to in just a second, um, 
programs can use your step score to categorize you on whether or not you deserve an invitation for an interview or not. And this applies to every specialty, but for the most part applies to the most competitive specialties like radiology, dermatology, ophthalmology, orthopedics, uh, general surgery. And recently OB has been climbing in um, competitive specialty type. Um, so that's always something that you have to be prepared for and you are not a number but the number is important. Um, when I first got my step score back I was devastated because I didn't do as well as I wanted to do. I still did well but I could have done better and I pushed myself too hard and I gave myself a really hard time because of it and I, I could have done a lot better. Um, if you are looking for resources to step, study for step one, I used USMLE, um, what is it, first date for the USMLE step one. Um, and I do have a little study schedule of uh, a copy of my personal study schedule uh, on the blog. I will link it in the description box below so you can access it. You do have to subscribe to my blog newsletter in order to get access to this list, but you can always um, unsubscribe if you are not interested. So after third year, when you're done with your clinical rotations, you have to take another step, USMLE Step 2. And USMLE Step 2 has two components. The first one is called um, Step 2 CK, which stands for Step 2 Clinical Knowledge. And this test is basically like another version of USMLE Step 1, but the good thing about it is that it's more directed towards clinical knowledge versus basic science knowledge. And I actually did really well on Step 2, even though I had a bunch of issues with some friends and studying issues and moving issues, and there was just a lot going on in the four time the four week period that I was studying. But step two is a little bit easier in the sense that you have been working hands on for a year in your clinical rotations and you have started to begin thinking in the way that they want you to think for these exams. And most of the questions are going to be most likely diagnosis, next step in diagnosis, and next step in management. Um, and it's easier to apply that kind of knowledge to applying basic science knowledge to these multiple choice questions that have like very various depths of complexity. And then the second part is called USMLE Step 2 CS, which is clinical skills. This exam is basically done with standardized patients and it's a like person to person interaction with a person that's acting like a patient. Um, the only bad part about this exam is that there's only five testing centers. One is in um, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Houston, LA, and I am missing one that I do not remember, but I think there was another one. Um, and this test is about a day long it is very expensive and it also has several components. So one of the components that they want to evaluate you on is your ability to perform an adequate history and physical exam. The second part is how you communicate with the patient. So they evaluate your ability to dominate the English language and medical language so that you can um, talk to the patients and explain in layman's terms or simplify medical terms so that the patient can understand you. And then the third component is writing a note. Writing a note that has all the pertinent important information about your patient into, into your note, your SOAP note. Um, it has to have a subjective part, an objective part, an assessment, and a plan. And they want you to do this in a very systematic fashion so that it's standardized, you know? Um, 
for me personally, I took Step 2 CS in Houston and I had a really nice experience. I feel like the, the people at the center are really nice. They are very knowledgeable and they're very um, keen to help you out. Okay, so we've basically been through most of med school <laughs> by now and it's time to apply to residency. You apply to residency through your fourth year. So you apply to residency throughout your fourth year. Um, usually it's really good if you have taken step 2 CK and if you have taken or in the process of taking or in the process of taking step 2 CS when you submit your applications. So just like almost everything in my path to where I am today, um, my path to residency or my application to residency was very non-traditional and it will likely be not relatable to anyone else except all those who lived it with me. And the reason is because um, since I'm from Puerto Rico and I lived in Puerto Rico all of my life, I was there when Hurricane Maria hit. And Hurricane Maria hit the day after, or the day before, my bad, the day before um, ap residency applications were due. I basically didn't know what was going to happen. I submitted everything, I had everything ready, and I just submitted it in a leap of hope and hope for the best. And it worked out, but I won't say that it wasn't stressful. And this is my little kiddo. So you fill out ARES, the Electronic Residency Application Service. Um, it's like an online platform, just like the Common App and AMCAS and all those electronic things for applications. Um, you input all of your information, you choose your programs, and then you send, you submit all your info, it goes out to the programs, they evaluate it, and then they decide um, if they want to invite you over for an interview. And yeah. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more about the exact steps that I took for my Road to Residency, I have a whole series on my blog called Road to Residency Series, and it takes you from how I chose all my programs and I made my list of programs that I wanted to apply to, to filling out ERAs, to doing um, away rotations, going to interviews, doing your rank list, submitting your rank list, going through match day and even um, there is a post in there about the soap. I will go through all of these details very quickly. Um, so when you submit your application and you have to have all the programs that you want to apply to and in addition to that you have to have all your, all your information ready so that, that you can select all your programs, make your payment and blah 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 blah. All these standardized protocols. When you go for your interviews they basically just want to get to know you as a person and see if you are going to be a fit for their program. They want to know what qualities you have that, you know, are going to be very important um, to the program and what you can contribute to the program. And then you go on and you decide on the places that interviewed you, which places you liked more than others and the reason why, and then you put them into a list. It's called your rank list. And you can have as many programs here as you want, depending on the number of interviews that you got. This then goes into a system called the NRMP, or the National Residency Match Program. And it goes through a whole algorithm, which I will link a video of how the algorithm works down below. Um, and then the algorithm just basically matches you to a program. And then, ta-da, you match, you have a job. Um, <laughs> It sounds very simple, but it is not. If you go to my blog and you see all the um, posts, which each section in detail with pictures and taking you through all the steps, um, you will see that it's actually a very complex thing. Keep in mind that while you're doing all of this, you're still having rotations. You're having your fourth year rotations, your sub internships, you're trying to go to places to get to know you and find a place that's going to work for you and advancing your knowledge. Um, after match, you, for match day, there's only two options. So either you matched or you didn't match. If you didn't match, then you have to go through the SOAP. Not really sure what the letters stand for. Let me look it up. 
So SOAP stands for Post Match Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program. And basically it goes through all the slots that are open or all the positions that remained open after match so that the people who didn't match can try to apply to those in a very short period of time um, to try and get a job for next year. And then after that, um, once you matched, you matched, you have, you have a responsibility to go to that program if you fulfill all your graduation requirements. Um, and you will sign a contract basically for about a year. Basically that is general for everyone who goes into medicine. I have some specific um, tips on how to do OB. OBGYN is a specialty that is both clinical, primary care, and surgical. So you have to be a person that is able to m merge all of these things together in conjunction in a cohesive way. We also have very sensitive patients. We have pregnant patients, we have elderly patients, we have women of all ages, including teenagers, who are going through a lot of things. So taking steps throughout your journey from college to med school and all of that to prepare you to better deal with these circumstances, everything that you do is going to be helpful. Um, so for residency, it's going to depend on what you go into. So if you go into family medicine, emergency medicine, pediatrics, um, internal medicine, I think I already said it, um, psychiatry, all those programs are non-surgical specialties. So they have three-year programs after which you are trained in that specialty and you can practice. Um, surgical specialties like OBGYN, basically we are one of a kind, we are a four-year program in which you get trained in both surgeries and clinical practice and all the aspects that are important for women's health. General surgery, orthopedics, um, urology, and all of those are five-year programs for the most part. They can be even longer depending on the specialty and I don't know much about those. They, I know they have, some of them have their own application service, which is a different um, category altogether. But for all the other general specialties, this is the process that you have to go through. So why is all of this important? Well, because if you are a high school kid watching this video and you wanna be a doctor, you have to study hard. You have to be a person that is dedicated and motivated to study and work through all of the hardest things you will ever face in order to reach your dream. Like being good in school as a high schooler and trying to get into college and getting all your studying done is hard. It takes hard work, it takes lots of sacrifice. So while other people were out there partying, I was home studying, I was working, I was trying to do everything that I needed to do to be able to achieve my dream. Same for med school. Med school is hard, people. It's really, really hard. Um, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, and it transformed me. It morphed me into the person that I am today. And now residency, I'm in another stage of my training, and I am enjoying every part of it, even the good, the bad, and the ugly. I learn something from every single thing and I am a dedicated person. I have to make sacrifices, which is why I look like this today. I just got home from work. Um, I had clinics, so I got out early and I'm sitting here without makeup talking to you about how to make your dreams possible. So if you want to be a doctor, just do it. Just go for it, but know that you're going to have to make sacrifices and you're going to be dedicated. After residency, you have a couple options. You can take your board and be a board certified physician and practice in that specialty. Or you can go into fellowship, which is basically going through the match all over again and doing this all over again. Why? Because, well, a lot of us are apparently masochists and we like going through the same process, the same tedious process all over again. So there you have it guys. I hope this isn't too long and I hope it's condensed enough that you, I can go through all the steps and you have a better idea of what the journey to becoming a doctor looks like. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe down below if you haven't already. 
follow me on social media so that you can know what I'm up to. I talk on there a lot, I vent on there a lot, and you can see my day to day in the hospital, in clinic, whatever I'm doing in my personal life as well. Um, so thank you so much for watching. I am very happy with the people that have reached out to me already in my previous videos. Um, click subscribe, welcome back, don't come back, whatever floats your boat. But thanks so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys! Chance concealing what deep down I felt for you